Hey, what's up, New Zealand and the world? Lucas Lawman's Kiwi Voice. Great to be back on air once again. I've almost fully recovered from COVID. I'm about 80 or 90% there on day four. So I really stoked about that. Felt a million times better today than I did yesterday. Look, there's been some interesting announcements over the last couple of days regards to some policy changes that they've announced over the last couple of days in a number of areas. We'll take a look at those. We're also going to take it take a look at recent developments in the mandate space in terms of the recent decision and what that uh, uh, for the police to force and defense force what that means for the wider employment community and their mandates we're also going to take a brief look into the commerce commission's report findings that were released uh, in relation to the grocery sector and the investigation that they did there and what the government's response is to that so Let's get into it. Now, health and dis just as a recap, health and disability staff were mandated to take the COVID-19 vaccine last year. They needed to have their first dose by the 15th of November, referencing the uh, Ministry of Health website here. Second dose needed to be received by January the 1st, so keep that in mind. Then they amended that order to need, that mean that all employees in the health and disability sector needed to have their booster shot by the 14th of February 2022. And for some reason along the line there, that was pushed out to the 24th of February 2022. Subsequent to that, as we've heard recently, it's been touted as a big win in the freedom community as well as for the people that were actually challenging it in those police forces. The police and defence force personnel had their mandates ruled unlawful uh, in the High Court. Uh, there's Radio New Zealand reporting on it there. Now, the High Court quashes unlawful vaccine mandate for police and defence force staff. In that ruling, Justice Cook today released a decision which upheld their claims. The vaccination order breached their rights under the Bill of Rights Act. Now, keep that one in mind. While the judge did not accept that some of the applicant's arguments, he agreed that the mandate infringed on Section 11 and Section 15 of the Act. Uh, the order limits the right to be free to refuse medical treatment recognised by the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act because of its limitation on people's rights to remain employed and it limits the right to manifest religious beliefs for those who decline to be vaccinated because the vaccine has been tested on cells derived from a human fetus which is contrary to to their religious beliefs, just as Cook said. So taking all of that in, you would think that if that applies, logic would dictate that if that applies to police and defence force staff, unlawful, against the Bill of Rights, then how does it apply to any other industry? So you've got to remember, we've still got hospitality workers still in place, teachers, fire, firemen, you know, you name it, we've got over 60% of our workforce mandated. If it's unlawful for these guys, why is it not unlawful for anything else? Also really does my head in is the large faction of the public that actually supports keeping the existing ones in place when rulings like this continue to come out. But hey, go figure. Now going back to the health and disability staff, we'll see that yesterday as stuff reported, COVID positive healthcare workers are now allowed to return to work as self-isolation rules change. So if we've kicked over 1,200 healthcare workers out of work at a time when we had 3,500 nursing vacancies as previously reported on Kiwi Voice, then how does it make possible sense that these guys are allowed to go back to work? One arrangement stuff reports put in place to address this allows staff members with COVID-19 to return to work earlier than usual if a critical health service would have to stop functioning in their absence. Positive healthcare workers need to be fully vaccinated and boosted, asymptomatic or have mild symptoms and they must work in a position where their absence puts an essential service at risk. That is from a Director of Public Health, the Government Caroline McElnay, uh, she announced that the other, yesterday. Big irony in that, uh, or the weirdness, or whichever way you want to look at it, is that fully healthy, negative testing healthcare workers that are currently unemployed are not, obviously, allowed to go into the hospital. So, again, where's the outcry for this? This is total madness in terms of policy from where I sit. A... COVID positive vaccinated worker can go into the hospital 
and and do their duty and work and look after sick people, whereas in healthy negative testing unvaccinated worker loses their job. This is this is the world that we're living in at the moment. The next step that has come up in terms of policy changes, as reported here by Radio New Zealand, COVID-19 isolation period, which I'm enduring at the moment, as of Friday, 11.59pm, which is tomorrow as I record this, reduces from 10 to 7 days. So I can get out on Sunday instead of Tuesday. Now, where's the science behind this? Well, what we'll get is... These words here, I don't know if you can read that, it might be a little bit small, but Chris Hipkins, our favourite COVID-19 health response minister, he says, they've looked at international evidence really closely and the vast majority of infections are picked up within the first seven days. Okay, so why has it been 10 days all this all this time? And why now drop it to seven days? Well, the, as he says below, uh, the good part of this is that it stops the virus being passed on and it helps to keep our vulnerable friends and family safe. And it protects their health system. But we are also now seeing the impact that it has on other parts of our lives. Oh, just now? Not two years ago? Well, that's nice. Better late than never, I guess. And it does have an impact on food supply chains, for example, and on businesses' day-to-day operations, including some critical businesses that we all rely on, like transport services. Well, we could have given you a big told you so on that one, Hipkins, but... At any rate, that's the changes and that's the justification for them there. Gone from 10 to 7 because they think that it's gonna, it's putting too much pressure on the workforce. So there you go. The next, next bit that I just thought was interesting in line with all of this here is all of this policy has revolved around rapid antigen testing and the massive influx of that and the 20, 30,000 cases that we're getting a day is all based on rats or at least 97% as reported today. Then we've got an article halfway down the uh, main page of stuff. Why RITs are good but not great for confirming COVID. So what have we got there? Studies on rat tests, on the other hand, highlight that many vulnerabilities in the public published medical literature, one can find sensitivities for rats ranging from a miserably low 40% right up to the 98% printed on some manufacturer's advertisements. So somewhere between 40 and 98%. Correct. Rats are significantly less good at correctly identifying those who are the really in the very early days of infection, very late in the infection, those who've had a single test rather than repeated tests over several days, and those who don't do the test correctly. So it sounds to me like all of that is a huge amount of potential for error, and yet here we are controlling an entire economy putting businesses into positions where they have to shut after two years of restrictions and 30,000 businesses closing on tests that work only half the time. Yep, it continues on. Let's jump away from COVID though for a moment. Let's get into the results of the Commerce Commission report into grocery prices. So as you know, inflation is at all-time highs. Petrol prices are over $3 a litre and food prices have increased by 6% also year on year. The average family across all of living expenses, including rent, petrol and food, are now spending somewhere between five and $7,000 a year more. Well, not spending are going to have to, and a lot of them just won't be able to. This is going to push a lot of people over. Although the, the Prime Minister refused to call this a crisis, here's some more evidence that we're not going to get actually any relief from them anytime soon either. So this was the market study that was uh, commissioned by the government through the Commerce Commission. Basically, they're looking into how the retailers deal with their suppliers, who, consu- who consumes uh, and buys groceries from those retailers, the competition level, what retailers are making and what they're charging. So this report was commissioned in November 2020. One year and three months later, I have no idea why it takes that long to do such a thing. Meanwhile, the inflation continues. Meanwhile, the price, the food prices and con- continues. It releases its findings and its findings are it's not working. Huh. Well, funny that, isn't that why you ask for the investigation in the workplace? They need more competition as the other key metric. They've discovered that excess profits of over a million dollars a day are being made 
every single day. Now, the government's response, as reported by the Herald, the key re recommendations coming out of it are it addresses addressing the imbalances in bargaining power between the major grocery retailers and many of their suppliers by introducing a mandatory grocery code of conduct, freeing up land for supermarket development through changes to planning laws, etc. The major grocery retailers, Woolworths and Foodstuffs, offering wholesale supply to other grocery retailers on a voluntary basis. And that's like the market makers in the electricity industry, for example, subject to some limited regulatory measures helping consumers make more informed purchasing decisions and enhancing competition at the retail level by introducing mandatory unit pricing. He said they wanted to see a material change, and if that didn't happen, they would look at other options. Legislation would be introduced this year to support the changes. So at some stage this year, the government's going to introduce some changes, but they stop short of doing anything around breaking up the duopoly uh, forcefully, which can be done easily through Commerce Commission law. I'm going to try and make it easier for a third party to come in. But here we are. My opinion from where I sit is that it's a year and a half after they've started this investigation and they're saying it's going to be another 9 to 12 months before they're going to do anything. And then obviously we won't see the effect of that for probably another year. Meanwhile, more and more people on the bread line are getting pushed further down there. The last point I want to cover off, which I just picked up just before I started filming this video, and I thought it was worth chucking in there, back to the COVID policy response. They've also announced on Thursday, which is today, that the government, from the podium of truth, that officials will be moving to a new reporting approach regarding COVID-19 deaths, counting all deaths within 28 days of a COVID-19 diagnosis. Now, why? I don't know. These will be broken into three categories, Ashley Bloomfield said. The first category will be those who clearly died of COVID-19. As of today, that number is 34 in New Zealand over the last two years. The second group who were found to have had COVID-19 after they died, but whose cause of death was not caused by the virus, they confirmed that number as of Thursday is two, which includes the man who died of a gunshot wound in his driveway. The third group is those whose deaths remain under investigation, whatever that means. As of Thursday, that was 48 people. The COVID show in New Zealand does continue on while the rest of the world drops its restrictions. We are making up all sorts of weird changes and slowly and painfully easing out of restrictions and edging back people's freedom teensy bit by teensy bit fun times thanks everyone for tuning in hope you enjoyed the roundup if you're watching this on facebook hit that like button comment down below share these links around thanks to everyone that's done so to this point if you're watching this on youtube hit that subscribe button if you have not already yet also comment down below i try and answer all comments although as things grow and get busier it's getting harder to get back to absolutely everyone have an awesome rest of the day stay safe stay free and we'll see you again real soon